Welcome, everybody. Thank you for your, I guess, willingness to show up a half an hour late today. Um, the reason for it is my daughter is writing her grade seven ballet exam today. And not, she's not in grade seven, she's in grade 12, but grade seven, if you're into ballet, CDTA, the highest level it goes is grade seven. So she's writing that today. If she passes the test, she'll be the first person in, I believe, Nova Scotia since 2011 to pass that test. So she's doing it as we speak. So best of luck to her. Um, our game plan for today, we only have about 50 minutes, which hopefully is plenty of time to sink in some chemistry. Finish off this cannabis chapter, which it turns out we were like 98% done, last class anyway. So we'll finish off the last couple of slides, just one last little piece I wanted to talk about, a very important piece. And then we're gonna start a new unit, which is on plastics. So what this means is that our unit assignment for the previous unit on cannabis is going to be due a week from today, which I think by my math is April 7th. And that means we have a new unit assignment that will be starting today. We have, if I had everything work out for me just ideally, we would have three units left. We have the polymers one we're gonna be starting today, and I have two other ones that I think we, we should be able to manage. Uh, not that I'm hurrying, we'll do what we can do. I, I guess my worry is, is the unit assignments, be, just because technically we're not allowed to assign work to you that are due after the last day of classes. So once we kind of get into the last couple of classes, those unit assignments are technically not supposed to extend past the 13th in terms of the due date. Um, I think what I might do there is do it anyway, just with the idea being like the only other option really is to have the due date the 13th and then you just have less time to do it. So it will be open and you can do it prior to the 13th. If you want to look at it this way, I'm being a little bit lenient and letting you get it in after that date. So that works too. Uh, I did want to comment too just about the final exam because the final exam, I did get some emails about that. Um, I talked about it in previous class as well as sent it by email on March 15th. And if you didn't read my emails or don't get them or lost them or whatever, you can always go back onto our ACORN page at the very top, click announcements, and it'll have a full list of all of the emails that I've sent you already. Short story is the final exam is going to be cumulative. It's going to be roughly 100 questions, all multiple choice. It's going to be on ACORN and it's not in a scheduled slot, which is why it doesn't appear in the exam schedule with all the other exams. So what I'm gonna be doing is having about a week or so where the exam will be open, and you can choose any time during that week to begin your exam, and once you begin, the time starts. So you can't like spend 10 minutes on it and then close it and then come back three days later and continue on it. So you may have to make sure you have a block of time available to write it. Um, so what I can do is uh, for the exam, what I'll do before, before we write it is I'll give you an idea of how long the average student takes to write this exam. Um, because definitely very few students take a full three hours. I would say probably last time I did an online exam like this, which is last year, the 100 multiple choice questions, it probably had 90% of the class done within an hour. So, you know, I'd give yourself the time, you have the time, you have three hours, but just because you have the time doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna need it. Uh, once you do it, it gets submitted, and you will see, be able to see your grade probably once the, like, the due date closes, if you know what I mean. I think the way it works too is, you know, it's gonna have this week-long range. At the end of the week, it'll just auto-submit any live sessions. So let's say it closes at 10 p.m. and you started at 9 p.m. An hour in, it'll just automatically submit, it'll close and you'll be done. 
So when you're deciding when you want to do it, um, and if you want to do it last minute, you have to actually start three hours before the last minute if you want to have three hours to actually write it. Cool. So I, I think another thing that might be useful is if you check out, again, it's in my recording, it's in an email, it's in the new syllabus I posted, um, what the new marking scheme looks like, because for many of you, your final exam might only be worth 10% of your grade for your course. So, so lots of flexibility built in there. Hope everyone's doing okay. I know like this time of year is a crazy crunch for a lot of people, for a lot of courses. I guess including this one because we have assignment two looming. Um, but you'll get through it. In two weeks, you can r raise your head and then you'll be in the middle of exams. So I don't know if that's comforting at all. Maybe it's the opposite. I apologize if that's the case. Um, it's crunch time for me too. I know like I have a couple of honor students that are presenting and the due date is today actually for them. So I've been very busy with them and uh, yeah, lots of fun going on. I feel like with the strike, it's like the amount of work didn't decrease. It's just got crammed into less weeks. So that's life. We'll get through it. We're doing good. And we're learning about cannabis. So we spent all last class, we did a lot of, talked a lot about various aspects of cannabis chemistry, what chemically actually happens when you take cannabis and you heat it and all that kind of stuff. Um, the last piece that I wanted to talk about today were the health risks, because we did talk about the toxicity and we said that, you know, while uh, it's not like an ultra toxic compound, THC, um, what's probably more concerning about it in terms of health effects is possible long-term psychiatric consequences of the use. So I could talk about this a little bit. A lot of the information on this is still quite new and um, may maybe new isn't the word, but like there isn't a huge body of, of, of data and evidence yet and it's growing, it's growing quicker than it ever has and our understanding is continuing to evolve. Uh, so like everything I'm gonna talk about today is probably, I guess you could say um, like uh, still at a, like an early stage and may later be proven to be a little bit different or completely different. But one such study, and this is an old study going back to 1987 in Lancet. Lancet is a very highly regarded medical journal. You may remember the Lancet as being the journal where Andrew Wakefield posted or submitted his paper linking vaccines to autism and things like that, um, which is later retracted and et cetera, et cetera. So that's the same journal, Lancet, 1987. Um, there was a study of 45,570 uh, heavy users of marijuana from Sweden, and they were followed over 16 years. And this is sort of an epidemiological study looking at the, the incidence of a whole bunch of different types of things. And what they found is that people in this group had a six times greater likelihood of developing schizophrenia. And so this is clearly a, a, a troubling finding, I guess. And uh, there was a follow-up study that was published in the British uh, Medical Journal in 2002 with the same group that were followed over even a longer time period. It confirmed the initial findings uh, regarding schizophrenia and found that moderate use um, doubled one's risk. And moderate use in the paper was defined as using it 11 to 50 times over a 15 year period. And I guess I defined heavy use as anything higher than 50. So it's like what, once every 15 weeks? Once every three months they considered heavy use, which I'm sure a lot of people use it a lot more than that. Uh, they found that double one's risk. So the risk uh, was actually proportional to the dose, I guess, which is, which is what you'd expect, right? As with any, any chemical. Uh, this is what the 2017, a little more recently, um, further research demonstrates that cannabis has a differential risk on susceptible versus non-susceptible individuals. In other words, young people with a genetic susceptibility to schizophrenia 
those who have psychiatric disorders in their families should bear in mind they're playing with fire if they smoke pot during adolescence. So what, what current research seems to be pointing towards is a situation where some people maybe can use it without risk of any kind of psychiatric outcomes, negative psychiatric outcomes, whereas others might be much more susceptible. And I don't think we really have any idea what the percentage of the population that is, but there are signs that it could, could be uh, related to family history and things along those lines. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. Uh, when the initial study came out, there was this issue of causation and correlation. Was it the marijuana use that was causing people's likelihood of developing schizophrenia to increase, or was it that people who were sort of pre-schizophrenic or had a likelihood of developing schizophrenia, they were more likely to go smoke marijuana. Wasn't clear which way that fell. But this is sort of the, the closest we have, I guess, to a modern consensus on this particular issue, that if you have psychiatric issues, um, particularly while you're during adolescent, during adolescent phases, uh, it seems to have the greatest impact on people during that point in their life. Journal of the American Medical Association, Association of Cannabis Use in Adolescence and Risk of Depression, Anxiety, and Suicidality in Young Adulthood. Um, this is a, a, um, a review and meta-analysis, which means this is a study where the authors sort of critically examine many papers that are published in this space and kind of pick the ones that are the best studies. The best studies typically would have the most participants, the most transparent um, methods and th these sorts of things, and kind of assign weightings, I suppose, to each of the different studies based on the quality of the information and the data, and try from all of what's out there to draw kind of a, uh, a summary, um, like, a, like a summary decision or explanation or whatever. So this is what they find. Uh, they, they looked at 11 different studies with 23,000 subjects. Adolescent cannabis consumption was associated with increased risk of depression and suicidal behavior later in life, even in the absence of a pre-morbid condition. There was no association with anxiety. This translates to some 413,000 young adult cases of depression potentially attributable to can cannabis exposure just in the U.S. Considering that the population of young people between uh, 18 and 34 is 70 million, and the incidence of depression is 8.1%. So it's not just schizophrenia, but there's newer studies coming out that are linking the chronic use of this drug, among adolescents at least, with other, I guess, mood disorders, I guess you could call them. Except anxiety, I guess, it doesn't, appear, appears to not be associated with that. It's another one from 2016. Uh, reductions in cannabis use are associated with mood improvement in female emerging adults. I find that term emerging adults funny. Like, it reminds me of like a butterfly emerging out of a cocoon as an adult insect. But I think what it means is like basically late teens, maybe early 20s. Um, so they indicate a relationship between reductions in cannabis use and reductions in depression symptoms among female emerging adults who report at least mild depression sim symptoms. So I, I don't know, to me this is something to think about if you know somebody or maybe you yourself are a heavy user and maybe suffering from some of these things, one thing to consider is maybe, you know, changing your usage patterns for sure. One more, <clears throat> Journal of Clinical Psychiatry. Association of Cannabis with Long-Term Clinical Symptoms and Anxiety and Mood Disorders, a review. Recent cannabis use was associated with negative long-term symptomatic and treatment outcomes among across anxiety and mood disorders. So, um, you know, there's increasing numbers of these articles that are being put out right now. Yeah, question. Yeah, so that was a very interesting point, because I'm sure nobody online could hear that. It was 
Um, is it possible that this could be helpful for some people? Um, because, you, you know, it, it's definitely, I think, it makes sense. It's a, a compound that you're taking, which it's known to have a, a psychotropic effect. It's known to have not only short-term, but also long-term psychotropic effects. Um, you know, it seems like in the large majority of people who start using it during adolescence, there's many papers showing connections between that type of use and negative long-term outcomes. But there's much less study about people who are beyond their adolescent phase when, for the most part, um, I'm not going to say you, you stop maturing or stop whatever, but like it, it, you're certainly in a different phase of development when you're older. Um, I don't know. I think like, obviously everybody would re respond differently, and I'm sure there are people that it could very much help. Uh, and I know it is actively being used for other things like people who might have um, uh, like appetite issues for improving appetite and things like that or for inflammation or pain or things like that as well. So I really feel like this is something where the consensus is starting. Probably if you are a teenager, it's a good idea to stay away from it. Um, but after that, I guess it's, it, it, it's up, for, up for debate. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's a very good point as well. So for the people online, the comment was about CBD which it, versus THC. And THC is the psychotropic part, CBD is not. And CBD is, is obviously a component of, of cannabis, one of the cannabinoids that's in the plant, and is normally the one uh, that people use for medical reasons, for, um, that's an interesting one too. I was reading actually about how that operates in the body and we have cannabinoid receptors and we have natural endocannabinoids in our body, the most important one being anandamide. And what CBD does, it doesn't actually interact with our CBD receptors. What it does is it reacts with some different receptor which, which shuts down production of anandamide. So it actually, causes your natural levels of endocannabinoids to change as opposed to it having some direct effect, which is how THC works. So it's sort of like an indirect uh, way that it works in the body. So that could be it true. Like if you just use the whole plant and smoke the whole plant, you're getting it all. And it may be some of those compounds can have negative effects, some of them can have positive effects, but you're taking it all in together. And it's gonna be very interesting because I'm sure if you go from like 20 years from now, now that sort of the taboo on doing research of this type is lifting, um, I think you'll see a lot more investigation into this sort of thing. And right now, I, I, all I can really say is in terms of health effects, the water's kind of muddy. And, you know, I, I've heard all kinds of reports like you brought up of individuals who, you know, report great relief of certain symptoms. Um, so all I can really say is, could be good, could be bad. It's definitely shown to be bad in certain usage patterns in certain populations, uh, in certain ways. And that's all I can really say at this point. So hopefully, I don't know, uh, I hopefully you feel I'm being balanced with this, but really there's big question marks still on the horizon and like new stuff getting published every day. So these are the sorts of papers you need though, these like reviews, these systematic reviews and meta-analyses to actually try to extract from the multitude of publications now coming out where the truth actually lies. I'd love to see a Cochrane review come out on this issue. Cochrane reviews are, are very good, balanced, scientifically based, and uh, do a very good job of sorting out all of the, the different considerations. Um, all right, so I think another good place I could point you is the Health Canada has a website on it. And um, 
you know, it says cannabis contains substances that can affect the brain and body, including THC and CBD. THC has the intoxicating effects. CBD is not intoxicating, but can have effects on the brain. Uh, this gets updated all the time, too. I would probably recommend this as a unbiased place to get information. It is funny, too, with, with like, marijuana, too, because it has this, like, long history of being, um, I, I I guess the, of, of having governments, specifically the U.S. government, um, spread untruths about it, in in you know they used to call it reefer madness, and and all these things, and um, I, I can probably feel people when I point them to a government website saying this is a great place to go learn about this, <laughs> ready to scoff at me, saying what do you mean the government? <laughs> like because there is a history of that in definitely the U.S. But um, as far as I can tell, okay, as a non-expert, as a generalist, I'm a chemist, I'm a generalist, in this field, uh, I think the Health Canada website is a trustworthy place to go. All right, I think we're good. We're ready, I believe, to start talking about our next unit, which is on polymers. And I, I actually, I, I just wanted to say too, I, I really appreciate getting feedback from you folks directly like I love when people ask questions it's kind of nice like we have actually like in person a pretty small class actually online is pretty small today too we got 52 online um there's a hockey game right now isn't there what time does the hockey game start started at one okay so anyone got the score put the score in the chat if you got the score uh women's basketball is today too right Nationals in Kingston. Do you know when Acadia Axe Women play? Yeah, someone put that in the chat too. We cheer you on. Okay. They play at four? Oh, great. We'll all be out of here in time to see that. All right. Let me just get this next set of slides up. We're starting our next unit, which is loading, loading, loading. On polymers, which I guess is pro are probably more commonly known as plastics. And we are going to be, well, I guess plastics are a type of polymer. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the chemistry of these things, some issues around them. Uh, this is a pretty short one. We have a new unit assignment that is open today based on this. So if you're following along with me, please uh, get that out. All right, we got 4 p.m. for the Axe Women. Thank you. We've got a couple of chem majors on the women's basketball team. Lizzie, she's like the second team all-star. So she's third year chemistry student. And Tegan, who is in first year. All great. Okay. So what are polymers? Polymers, poly means many, and mer means unit. So a polymer is basically a chemical which is made out of some unit that is repeated many, many times. And if you have one of those units, we call it a monomer, mono meaning one, and string them together, we call it a polymer. And these are little beads that, I remember my kids had these when they were small. They're like a bead with a little like hole in one side and then a, and you could snap them together. This one toy of the year in like, I don't know, 2004 or something like that, because it was like you could make necklaces out of them, but you can't choke on them easy because they can just pull it off and it breaks. So, but they're also great for talking about polymers because really this is what happens. You take a molecule, like a small piece of a molecule, and if you repeat the subunit many, many times, you have a polymer. And so there are polymers that are natural molecules. Uh, cellulose is an example of this. Cellulose is, I guess in food, what you would call fiber. Cellulose are long strings of uh, sugar units, these units called cell bios units, carbohydrates. And these are uh, not digestible by human beings. They're digestible by some bacteria though. So like. Cows, I believe, have like this symbiotic relationship with the bacteria that can break down cellulose. 
Cellulose is like, um, cotton is like almost 100% cellulose. You find cellulose in, in any kind of plant, woody material. It's all this fibery stuff. And so you have these molecules, which is this unit that you see here, which is a carbohydrate unit, repeated again and again and again in very long strings. So you get thousands of these in a row uh, to get these long strings. And then in a plant fiber, what happens is these strings bundle together a specific way, and then you end up seeing these like fibering, fibrous strands for something like cotton, which we use to make clothing, uh, lots of other fabric type things too, like flax and hemp and different things that we can use to make clothing. Uh, DNA and RNA are also polymers. We have a monomer here, which is made up of three parts. There's what we call a base. We have a sugar. And we have a phosphate. And what happens is these three components make up one monomer. And if you string together many of these components, like you see here, here, and here, you know, those are the connections, um, we got a DNA strand or an RNA strand. The difference is this one is RNA. DNA is missing that OH. So it's a deoxy, you take one oxygen out and you have DNA. Proteins are also polymers. Proteins are made up of uh, a repeating string of amino acids. And there are about 20 naturally occurring amino acids that all of the proteins in our bodies are made out of. And it's just a linear string of these things, just like a long string of beads you can think about where each bead is one amino acid and all the different proteins in our body are um, different based on the sequence of amino acids that, that are in each, um, each polymer, in each protein strand. And actually it's the DNA pattern of bases that code for the pattern of amino acids in the proteins. So there's a direct relationship between the, the pattern you see in DNA and the pattern you see in, in a protein that's, that's made. So that means if you, you damage DNA, if you change one of the base pairs, if you change one of the, the uh, monomers, it actually will change one of the amino acids and can make misshapen proteins and have proteins that don't actually function properly. Now, they're more than just a string. The strings also then can coil up and make like three-dimensional shapes. And the three-dimensional shape is also responsible for how the protein operates. But we're not going to get into that here. Take biochem one, if you're interested in, in, in that a aspect of biochemistry. So all the amino acids look sort of the same. They have the nitrogen here, which is an amino group. And then this part here, which is called an acid group or a carboxylic acid. So that's why they're called amino acids. They have an amine and an acid. And then what makes all of the different um, uh, amino acids different is whatever that group R is, that can be a lot of different things. It could be about 20 different things. Cool. So these are all of them. These are all the individual amino acids. Um, people that work out a lot, go to the gym, may take protein supplements. And you may know <laughs> a little bit about some of these because uh, there's, I guess, some research that suggests that it may be a good idea for certain people to take uh, BCAAs, they're called. BCAAs, which is branch chain amino acids. And so an example would be something like this one has a chain coming off of that position, and that would be like a branch right there. Same thing with leucine. It's got a branch right there. This one's branched, where maybe something like this is not branched, right? And they all have different side chains, and I don't know what, how much truth there is. Um, what I'm told by nutritionists or, or dietitians is like, if you go into a supplement store, there's probably like almost nothing in there that you really need, but who knows? If it helps, I'm not going to poo-poo it. So hemoglobin is a protein that's found in your blood cells, and it is red in color, and it gives blood its red color, and it has this sort of a shape, and if you look at this, it might just look like a hopeless snarl of ribbons and coils and all that. What it really is, is just a, it's a string of amino acids that's all folded up. 
in a nice little tight package. And sometimes different parts of the chain will fold up in coils, like you see here. We call those an alpha helix. Sometimes they'll line up and make like flat regions, which we call beta sheets. And there's all these other different structures that can happen. And they make this unique three-dimensional structure overall for a protein responsible for the protein's function. And I'm kind of lying a little bit here because I'm showing a piece of red meat. Uh, red meat is not red because of hemoglobin. It's red because of a, a, a different but related uh, enzyme, not, it's not an enzyme, it's a protein that's in the meat called uh, myoglobin. So hemoglobin and myoglobin are both, both do the job of storing and, and transporting oxygen. All right, we got a new question. We have a new unit assignment. Let's uh, jump in. What do we call the individual small molecules that are linked together to make polymers? We call them monomers. Which of the following is not a naturally occurring polymer? DNA is, protein is, latex actually is too. So latex is, um, you can see it's like a whitish substance that's being extracted from this plant. It can be used to make, you know, latex gloves or things like that. Starch also is a protein. Uh, estrogen is not. We looked a little bit into the structure of estrogen in the water unit where we talked about bisphenol A having a structure that looks a little bit similar to estrogen or estradiol. Um, but estrogen is just a small molecule, single molecule. It's not a long repeating chain. Synthetic polymers are what we're going to focus on most of all. I mean, there are all kinds of naturally occurring ones, but the synthetic ones are the ones that are of current importance and issue. Um, the first synthetic polymer was partially synthetic, was um, made by accident in 1846. Or maybe it was made before then, but this is when <laughs> the discovery was made. In those times, people like would do chemistry as a hobby. And that's kind of frowned upon today. But a lot of people might have like a kind of a little lab set up in their garage or set up in your home. And unlike today, people just didn't automatically assume you were trying to make drugs. And so what people would do is they buy glassware and they do all this sort of stuff. And so the story goes, apparently, uh, around 1846, there was somebody who was doing, had, had like a little bit of a home lab in their own kitchen. Which, that's another thing. I like to separate chemistry work from food. <laughs> I eat food in my kitchen. I don't eat anything that comes out of my lab. But anyway, he had on his kitchen table a bottle of concentrated nitric acid. And he, I guess he's wearing gloves or something, I don't know. But he accidentally knocked over the bottle and it spilled out on the table. And nitric acid will actually like react with wood, it'll turn up black, it'll, it'll kind of like eat away at it really quickly. So what he did is he kind of took a, like a dishcloth and he like sopped it all up and threw it in the sink and then he cleaned it all up and threw it in the sink and then took care of his table. And uh, eventually when he got that clean, he went back to the sink and he had this like nitric acid soaked uh, dishcloth there. So he turned the tap on and he rinsed all the nitric acid out and he wrung it dry. And then he hung it over by his fireplace to dry off the water that was still, so he could have a, you know, a dry cloth again. And he was, started doing his work or, you know, sitting around. And then he kind of looked over and then there was like a big flare of fire, a big flash. And then instantly he looked and the cloth was just gone. So it had just burst into a big thing of flames and was just gone. He said there was no smoke, there was no remnants of anything. It was just like it disappeared as fire. And what he had actually done accidentally was make uh, a new polymer called nitrocellulose, which is if you take cellulose, which is what is in a cloth, cotton, for example, you soak it in concentrated nitric acid for a while. Um, it'll take the cellulose unit, which you can kind of see is this part here, and adds all these nitro groups to it. And the material you get looks like cotton, like it looks the same. If you took a cotton ball, you could make this stuff. 
Uh, he obviously used a piece of fabric to do this. And it turns out nitric acid is extremely flammable. Because what can happen is when you burn something, you need a fuel and you need an oxidant. So you need oxygen typically from the air and you need the cellulose, the carbon or something to burn the fuel. And normally the rate of a, a fire depends on how quickly the oxidant can make its way to the fuel. So if you have a fire on a beach and you, know, you have the you know, bonfire and you got a bunch of wood in there, what keeps that reaction from just being over in 10 seconds is that oxygen has to find its way into the fire. And not only that, only wood in a fire can burn if it's on the surface. You can't burn from the center, right? So you have a small surface area of wood that's exposed. Oxygen gets used up and you need fresh oxygen to come in to continue it to go. And that keeps the, the, the fire burning at just a specific pace. It turns out if you put nitro groups on the molecule like this, the nitro groups do the job of oxygen. So all of the oxygen is right there, ready to go. And you don't need oxygen to do this fire. So it sort of has like its own built-in oxygen. And when you have this feature in a molecule, it makes it explosive. Because the oxidant is right there, ready to go. All you need is a spark. And then the whole thing just instantly, effectively, instantly burns and explodes. It found instant use as a gunpowder that was smokeless because it didn't produce any black smoke. The, the sort of the, the, the gunpowder of the day was this stuff called black powder, which I remember I made once as a kid, um, different times. My brother, I remember we, we found the recipe for it online and it wasn't online, there was no online then. I don't know where we found it. We found the recipe for black gunpowder and we had all the ingredients, we found them except for sulfur, we couldn't find. So my brother was in grade eight and he went to a science teacher and said we wanna make gunpowder so he came into the lab and brought him this like bottle of sulfur so we could go home and make gunpowder, which we did <laughs> and it worked. And, um, but the thing is it makes a huge amount of smoke, really smelly black smoke. And uh, that was considered a negative. Obviously, uh, if you wanna use this gunpowder indoors, it kind of pollutes the area pretty bad. But also if you're like using it in warfare and you take a shot, there's a big cloud from where the, of smoke from where the shot was taken. So it was very easy, if you were trying to be sneaky, to locate the location of the shooter. So it turns out nitrocellulose was smokeless, and so it was developed as an alternative called smokeless gunpowder. Nitrocellulose actually had another use, which was uh, a, a not a violent use, intentionally at least, where people realized you could take nitrocellulose and you could mix it with other things and you could produce a material called celluloid. And celluloid was the first material that um, film was put on. And so it was like a white, not white, like a clear colorless plastic that was flexible, kind of like you know any flexible plastic you would have today. It's around 80% nitrocellulose and it was used because you could make long strips of it and you could wind it on a reel and you could put images on that. And basically if you have that travel on a reel and you have a light that has a strobe, you can have it timed so that each time the light flashes, you get a new picture. And that's how movies were first made and invented and how they were first projected. So it was the invention of nitrocellulose that really allowed the movie industry to move forward because you needed a material like that. The only material they may have had before then was glass that could be even remotely close to this. And glass obviously isn't flexible. You can't make a reel of glass like this. So this was uh, the advance that was necessary to make movies going. Problem was, is you had now these reels where you had the movie on the reel and it's like basically 80% gunpowder effectively and so if that caught on fire, you'd have a really terrible situation in your hands. It was actually very common for movie theaters to catch on fire and burn down. And there's a few notable examples of, of disasters where this happened. Um, this was played a 
role in the plot of Inglorious Bastards, if anyone's ever seen that movie. And I think that what they said was the average lifetime of a movie theater back like in 1910, 1920 was like 10 years before it would burn down. And they're burning down all the time. So nitrocellulose is good, but not perfect. We still use nitrocellulose, by the way. It is notably used in ping pong balls. Ping pong balls are essentially 100% nitrocellulose. And I remember I learned this as a kid. We had like a ping pong table in our basement. And we also had a wood stove in our basement. And I think I was like a little pyromaniac when I was a kid. Um, so yeah, so when I, <laughs> what we used to do is if there was a, a fire in the, in the wood stove, I just like, we used to like randomly throw things in all the time just to see how they would burn. And boy, were we surprised when we threw in a ping pong ball and it like burst into flame. I should bring a ping pong ball here. We could do it here. We got nice space for it. But ping pong balls burn extremely well, extremely quickly, extremely rapidly. Not like an explosion, but like it'll burn way, way more strongly than you might expect it to. Uh, another material that is used is guitar. It's used for guitar picks. So if you ever felt a guitar pick or a ping pong ball, you get the kind of the feel where it's like a plastic that's like maybe not super durable, but it's like a little bit flexible, but a little bit rigid too. That's kind of the, the, the way nitrocellulose actually is. Celluloid, the other 20% is camphor. And camphor is actually a natural product that's found in um, rosemary, the plant. Uh, it was about 1907 when the first completely synthetic polymer was invented. And this was a material called Bakelite. And it was made by reacting two molecules, phenol and formaldehyde. And it produced this plastic that was hard, durable. I don't want to say brittle. It was actually pretty durable. Um, and it was actually used as a replacement for clay. Because clay was somewhat expensive. But if you know, if you have like a clay mug or a clay pot, it's pretty dense, you know? And, but the other thing about clay is it's very brittle. Like if you had a clay mug and you dropped it and fell on the floor, it's gonna shatter. So this was sort of a cheap alternative, I guess, to clay. And it was easy to work with. And it's still used today in things like poker chips. So if you pick up a poker chip, it's kind of dense and kind of heavy for what it is. It's not like a cheap weightless plastic, like it's, it feels like it's pretty dense. Um, those can be still made from Bakelite. And so it was used for dishes and things like that. It was used for like, it was cheap enough they could use it for common materials. So this got people excited. They're like, okay, you know, plastics are the next big wave. It's the, it's the thing of the future. We need to do a lot more research and find out some better materials that we can use. Because these early ones actually are kind of cool kind of good, they're cheap, and they, you know, replace natural materials that might be hard to get or might be expensive. So in the 1910s and 1920s, a lot of research was done by industry, by academia, learning as much as possible about these new materials, these polymers. DuPont, the company DuPont, which is still on the go, uh, created an experimental station and the idea was we, they wanted to just, this facility only do research with polymers and plastics. And so there was one person they wanted in particular, his name was Wallace Carruthers, and he was a, a professor at Harvard at the time. And they actually worked really hard to try to attract him to go work for his company, work for DuPont. And he resisted. They had to really fight hard to get him. They offered him a salary of $500 a month, which was double the salary he was making at Harvard as a professor. Uh, they also offered him complete unrestricted, uh, basically freedom to do any research he wanted. He had to lead a team, but he said, he, they said, you can do anything you want, anything you think is valuable, go for it. The only catch is anything that you discover belongs to the company. So you can't just discover something and they'll commercialize it on your own. We, we own your, your results, but we'll give you the space and the staff and the funding and everything else to make this happen. And even then, he was like very reluctant to do it. And the main reason he was reluctant to do it, as he said later on, 
is because he suffered from very serious mental health issues. He was suicidal, he was, had depression, and he had anxiety. And, and his belief was at the time that um, with these issues, he could like still integrate himself into a university and be forgiven, if you know what I mean. He figured if he went into like a corporate kind of environment, that those issues that he had would be too serious of a handicap and would either like become bigger problems or would result in like them wanting to get rid of them because they would become, you know, too big of a challenge for the company. And by the way, this is long before companies really made any effort to try to look after the mental health of the workers there. But in the end, they got him. They convinced him, they said, don't worry about it, we'll take care of you and whatever. So he started working for them. And in 1930, I think it was like his second year there or something like that, uh, he discovered, or his team, I should say, discovered a new polymer called neoprene, which has this repeating subunit right here. Well, I guess the subunit repeats from here to here. But it's like, this is a carbon, 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 carbon with a chlorine. I'm gonna decline that, I think. How's my wife? She knows I'm teaching. Um, so neoprene is a, a polymer that we still use today. You might notice these sort of spongy, foamy plastic that people would put on weights, or you know these kind of like spongy things that you can use to keep a, a can of pop cold. Um, those are still made of neoprene. I'd say like it's not like a major material that we use all the time, but definitely it's still in, in modern use. But what they were really looking for was a substitute for silk. Silk was considered kind of the uh, most fine or richest fabric at the time, but to make it is actually really difficult. It turns out silk and various ty types of silk that are found in nature, like the silk that's used in spider webs, are extremely strong and tough given their weight. It's one of the highest strength to, to mass ratios of any material that people had found. Uh, so not only does it make nice fabric and nice material, but also it's like extremely strong and durable and lightweight, which has other applications as well. So they were looking for a substitute for silk because silk is a pain to make. You, you take these worms and the worms, you feed them for a while, and then the worms like spin these little cocoons that you see here. Then what they have to do is once they spin the cocoons, they have to kill the animal, the, the, the worm. Then they like pull the worm out and then these, these like cocoons that you see here are a single strand of silk that's like wrapped around the insect like thousands and thousands of times. So they take these strands and they kind of peel them apart and make these long strings. And with these long strings, they can kind of weave them together. And then through a lot of work, you have silk fabric. Um, so it was expensive, it was time consuming. Um, you know, it was hard to scale up and that made silk a very expensive material. And it was a sign of wealth. And like any sign of wealth, if you can find a way to reproduce something that makes people feel wealthy, you can become wealthy yourself pretty quickly. So the first thing they actually discovered was polyester, which is still a fabric that's used a lot today. An early form of polyester, I guess I would say. But they really hit pay dirt in the late 1930s when they developed a new polymer called polyamide 66 was the code name for it. And this is better known as nylon. And nylon came out, uh, was commercialized the same year, 1938, and it was immediately successful. And what it was immediately commercialized as was women's stockings. And so one of the main uses of silk is women would wear um, basically kind of like leggings, I guess you could say, or, or pantyhose that, that you know, you'd, it was kind of somewhat clear, you know, like you could see through it a little bit. Sheer, I guess is the word for that. Um, but these were very expensive and typically they were very short. But that was okay because the fashions of the time, women only would wear long dresses. So you just had to have enough to like, if, if you went up like halfway to your knee, you were good. With nylons though, there was no limit anymore to how long they could be. The material was easy to make and it was cheap. You can make them really long, 
And it's actually believed that the invention of nylon permitted fashion changes that allowed women's dresses to get shorter and shorter because you could cheaply make nylons long enough to actually uh, close the gap. Now these nylons went on sale in 1938 and they actually came in a can like what you see here. And inside the can, along with a pair of, of stockings, was like a black crayon. And the purpose for the black crayon was actual real silk stockings were made like a sheet of fabric and they were you know, made round and then they were, had a seam. And when you put them on, there was a seam that went up the back of your leg, right? Like most clothes have seams. Um, nylons were, were seamless. They were made in one piece. And so the purpose of this crayon was once you put it on, you would draw the seam up the back of your leg to make people think you were wearing real silk. Because from like close inspection, you couldn't tell the difference. Um, so <laughs> it was actually like people, when these were first came out, they were so hot an item and so popular, people didn't want to think people that they were wearing these old fashioned silk ones. So the first thing they do is toss the crayon because they wanted to show off the fact that they had these new ones. Um, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to think. I wonder if the trend of women's dresses getting shorter had more to do with them wanting to show off more that they had these stockings because it made the stockings easier to see than, again, you know, it was kind of like a sign of wealth, but maybe more than a sign of wealth. It was a sign of like modern, modernness, modernity. That's the word I'm looking for. Um, so another great marketing technique, I think, is have something come out on the scene, have it be really popular and talked about, and then make it scarce. Because if it's scarce, then everyone really wants it for some reason. And in 1939, these were taken off the market and became ultra scarce and therefore ultra valuable. I think when they were first marketed, they came out for like a dollar or two for a can in 1938 dollars. And they were trading for like 20 or 30 dollars after they went off the market. You know why they went off the market? It was because in 1939, World War II started and they diverted all nylon production away from things like stockings and towards parachutes. Turns out they were awesome for parachutes because they were lightweight, they were tough, they were durable, they were strong, and they had military applications right away. So eventually, of course, they returned and started producing them again. Um, but yeah, this was like a major marketing success for DuPont. All right, I think I gotta stop here because we're out of time. I feel like we should have more time, but we started a little bit late today, so. Cool. Thank you all for coming. I will see you all next week as we continue.